Hello and welcome back to Ordinary Differential Equations, the video series where we talk about the theory of differential equations. And in today's part 22, we will talk about the important properties the matrix exponential function has. So at this point you should know that we can use the matrix exponential to write down the solution set of a system of linear differential equations. And therefore it's really important to know how to calculate with such a matrix function. However, before we go into the details, as always, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And moreover, I should also mention that you can use the link in the description to download additional material for all the videos. Okay, then for the start of this video, let's quickly recall what we already know about the matrix exponential. First of all, it's defined for every square matrix and let's call this one A. And then for every real number t, we can define e to the power t A, which is a square matrix again. In particular, we have exactly n columns and these span our solution space. Indeed, we have discussed that a lot, it's the solution space of the homogeneous system. And as you know, we always write it as x dot is equal to Ax. And now it's really important to remember, finding the solution set of this ODE is just calculating e to the power t a. And then any linear combination of the columns gives us a solution. And in this sense, we also easily find the unique solution of an initial value problem. And you know, usually we give the initial value as a vector x0 in Rn. And then in order to get the unique solution, we just have to multiply this vector with our matrix. And as we have already learned, we have to multiply it from the right hand side. Okay, so this is an important property we already have and therefore we want to discuss more about the matrix exponential and how we can calculate with it. And for a quick recap, let's state the definition again. This one is not complicated at all because it just uses the power series representation of the exponential function. Which means we have an infinite sum with k starting from 0 and going to infinity. And then inside we have t to the power k and a to the power k divided by k factorial. So you see we just have a lot of matrix multiplications and then we sum them up. And indeed this whole series here is convergent because we can just consider each entry of the matrix separately. Which simply means we have n times n different infinite sums of real numbers. Hence this is one possibility how you can interpret this convergence here. And then the result is that this matrix exists no matter which t and which matrix a we put in. And moreover this implies that each component here defines a nice real valued function. Let's simply say that we take the variable t from a given interval a b and then we map this one into r. Indeed for each point in the interval the value of the function is given as the limit of polynomials in t. And in addition since we chose a compact interval here it's not hard at all to show that we actually have uniform convergence for the sequence of functions. If you don't know what this means, you can check out my real analysis series for more information. Here in the following we will just use the fact that we have this nice strong uniform convergence. Indeed it implies that our matrix exponential is a differentiable function. We can quickly show that and also calculate the derivative of e to the power t a with respect to t. So we would write d dt of the matrix exponential. And as always a derivative is defined as a limit process. So for example we could say we take a small number h which we send to 0. And then we just take the matrix exponential at t plus h and then we subtract the value of the function at the point t. And finally we divide that by the given distance h. So you see this is the standard definition of the derivative at the point t but with matrices in the numerator instead of numbers. And in the same way as before, we have two possibilities to interpret this limit process. On the one hand, we can see it as a limit in the space of matrices with a given matrix norm. 
Or on the other hand, we can just see it as a standard limit process in each component of the matrix. In the end, both things are equivalent and you should just see that this limit process is well defined. And moreover, we can easily calculate it. And obviously in order to do that, we just have to put in the definition of the matrix exponential. In the first part, we have t plus h to the power k times a to the power k. And in the second part, we just have the matrix exponential just with t. And now since both infinite sums exist, we can just put them together. And to make it simple, let's pull a to the power k divided by k factorial to the font. And then we can just multiply that by the differences here we have in t. And now you might already see, what we actually want to do is to pull in this 1 over h and the limit h to 0. Obviously 1 over h is not a problem, but for the limit we need some requirement. Indeed, what is actually happening here is that we exchange two limit processes. In general, this is not possible, we would get a different result, but for the uniform convergence we know that we can pull the limit in. So you can remember, exchanging the limit process here is allowed because we have the uniform convergence of the functions. And then the result we get here is really helpful because what we have is the derivative of a polynomial. In other words, something that is really easy to calculate. Indeed, you should know that the derivative of t to the power k is k times t to the power k minus 1. This formula is correct for every k, except for the case where k is equal to 0. There we just have a constant, which has the derivative 0 anyway. And this implies that we can drop the case k is equal to 0 altogether, and we can start the sum at k is equal to 1. And moreover, instead of the limit, now we just have k times t to the power k minus 1. So it already looks much simpler, and we can also cancel that k here with a k in the denominator. In that sense, we only have k minus 1 factorial in the denominator. Moreover, also in the numerator we have t with the same power, k minus 1, and only the matrix A has one power too much. However, this is not a problem, because we can just take one matrix out of the matrix product. And then what you should see is, what we have in the front here is actually again our matrix exponential, just with a shifted index. But obviously the index shift does not change anything, so we can write again e to the power t a. But most importantly here, we should not forget that we have an additional matrix A we have to multiply from the right hand side. But actually, the right hand side was just a choice we took before, because we could also rewrite this product and take A out from the left. Which means we get an alternative result here, where A is multiplied from the left to the matrix exponential. Now we have shown that both things are the same, and represent the derivative of the matrix exponential at the point t. Indeed, I would say this derivative is easy to remember, because it looks exactly like we have it for the real exponential function. The exponential function remains, and the inner derivative a comes in front. However, here I should warn you that not everything you know from the real exponential function holds for the matrix exponential as well. And one thing is what we could call the exponentiation identity. For the standard exponential function, it means if you have the addition inside, then you can pull it out, and then you have the product of two exponential functions. This is quite nice, and if we work with the power series, you might know that we need the so-called Cauchy product for it. This is an important formula, which is quite nice, and you might remember, if we want to prove it by using the power series, we need a so-called Cauchy product. However, in this Cauchy product, we have to rearrange a lot of things to get the formula, which means we use the commutativity of the real numbers. But you already know that the standard matrix product is not commutative. Therefore, we can only prove this nice formula for matrices that actually commute. More precisely, we have to put in that AB is equal to BA. So please remember this important fact, in general, for two matrices, we don't have this exponentiation identity. However, since we have it for commuting matrices, we can use it to calculate the inverse of e to the power a. 
Namely, we can just multiply this by e to the power minus a. And since these two matrices are commuting, we can put them as a sum in the exponent. And then it's clear that we just get the zero matrix as a matrix exponential. And now by the power series formula from above, it's clear that this is the identity matrix. And obviously we can also do it the other way around and we get exactly the same calculation. And then you should know from the matrix calculations that these two equations here imply that the one matrix is the inverse of the other. Or in short, e to the power a inverse is equal to e to the power minus a. In other words, pulling in the minus sign also holds for the matrix exponential. Okay, so now you know a lot of properties for the matrix exponential function and in the next videos I will show you how we can use them for ODEs. Indeed, it's quite nice to solve systems of linear differential equations just with the matrix exponential. So let's meet in the next video again and have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you.